Good morning, church. I think that Indian summer is over and fall has come. My, yes, it is. You think you not hear me? Can you hear me now? Uh -huh. Thank you. So, yes, I think indeed that Indian summer has come to an end and winter and Fall and winter is on its way. My uh, sister and her husband live out in Cody, Wyoming. And they had 10 inches of snow yesterday, and they're now having um, below zero degree weather today. So all I can say is it could be a lot worse. <laughs> I'm Reverend Jim Mench. I'm the pastor here at North Salem United Methodist Church, and it's my delight to welcome you to worship today as we continue to worship inside, but trying to be as safe as we possibly can be during this very challenging time and in, in the life, not only of our church, but in the life of the country itself. What birthdays, what anniversaries, what special events do we have to celebrate today? Chris, do you have one? My birthday. Oh, no. <laughs> 33. 83, you said? No, oh, 33. <laughs> Thank goodness you're not 83. No. <laughs> so let's sing Happy Birthday to Chris. It's the one thing we do. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, God bless you. Happy birthday to you. All right. Any other special events we need to celebrate today? Well, a couple of announcements. Um, next Saturday is Halloween. Saturday is the 31st. And we would like to invite all of you to a Halloween parade next Saturday afternoon. We will be here in our church parking lot. What we're going to do is we're going to invite the young folks in our church community to come here to the parking lot about quarter of one next this Saturday afternoon. And what they'll do is they'll space themselves out around the outside of our parking lot. The rest of us, I'm going to invite you to come meet me down at Tessie's Pizza down on um, Irma Road, just like we did when we celebrated Robert Nouveau's uh, birthday. We'll gather down there. If you want to have some Halloween decorations on your car, that would be tremendous. And about 1 o'clock, we'll leave Tessie's Pizza, and we'll drive back here to the church, and we'll just come in, and we'll make kind of a U-shaped uh, turn through the church parking lot, um, having a chance to see the costumes of our young people having a chance to wave and, and shout greeting to them. At the same time, um, Tracy, uh, um, trustee, is putting together some um, Halloween um, gift baskets, I guess, or gift boxes would maybe be a better phrase, um, that we're going to be sending out to each one of our young people this week. There'll be some crafts and some games in there. Uh, there'll also be some uh, nut-free candy that we will um, share with the young people who come Saturday afternoon. So, Adrian, I want you to come, and there'll be others that will be here, and so I invite all of you, come join me down at Tessie's Pizza about quarter of one on Saturday, and we'll parade through the parking lot and have a time of celebration uh, with our young people. If you have questions, please give me a holler. I also want to remind everybody that our annual church conference is fast approaching. It will be on Wednesday evening, November the 4th. It will be a Zoom meeting this year. We'll not be meeting in person, um, but we will be, uh, Mark and I are working on the ability to gather here in the church sanctuary. So if someone does not have the ability to join us online, they could come here and be able to watch the, um, the, the service to chart the church conference on a, um, on a, uh, uh, a movie screen. 
Staff parish will meet with the district superintendent at six o'clock and then the meeting itself will begin at seven o'clock. I also wanna celebrate that this week we sent checks totaling $690 to the United Methodist Economic Ministry up in Salem Township, Maine. You may remember that when we returned inside back in September, uh, we gathered some canned goods, which are still on our altar rail. Some of you made donations, financial donations. Um, the Benevolent Ministry trustees made a donation as well. So we were able to send almost $700 to the um, ministry, United Methodist Ministry, a part of our conference uh, up in um, the western part of Maine, which will go to help them support their food pantry. Uh, we also are getting ready to send these food items and some clothes items up there as soon as we can make arrangements with John Blackadar to um, make a trip up in that direction. So on behalf of that ministry, I thank you so much. Uh, even though we are in a challenging time, even though everything seems upside down, there are still ways for us to be able to reach out and love our neighbor. And so I thank you so much for your generosity in doing so. Are there any other announcements we need to share today? Yes, Bill. The other thing is, uh, of course, the sign in cheeks, but also uh, we were needed some paper towels. I brought in a couple. We were ready to bring in one roll. We thought we'd for months, so uh, just keep that in mind. Appreciate it. Thank you. Good. Anyone else have any announcements? Let us continue our worship service then as we, with our call to worship, which you will find in your bulletin. Do you love the Lord your God? Then let us demonstrate our love through our worship today. Come and tell God through the silent prayer of your heart. Let us give God our love in return. Come now and worship. Let us pray. O oh, compassionate God, it is so easy for us to rattle off your great commandment, to love you with heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love our neighbor as ourselves. Yet we do not live it. Instead of loving you, we love the gods of our own making. Instead of loving our neighbor, we exploit, ignore, betray, and disregard one another. We are quick to judge others and slow to consider our own disobedience. Yet you see us clearly, hear our hearts as only you can. Love us in a new way of being, the way that you commanded. Amen. So Adrian, have you ever played Monopoly? Is it a good one? You like that one? Do you understand all the rules? Well, you do. Wow, you're doing better than I am then. I brought the rules from Monopoly just, just to kind of give you an example of, of what these sound like. To mortgage a property, you must first sell all buildings in its color set to the bank at half their cost. To mortgage, you need to turn down the title card and collect the mortgage value on the back from the bank. To repay a mortgage, you must pay the mortgage cost to the bank, which is the mortgage value plus 10%, then turn the card face up. Rent cannot be collected on properties if they're mortgaged. However, the increased rent level can be collected on the unmortgaged streets in a color set. You got that? <laughs> and they call this a kid's game. You know, some, some games we play, the rules are pretty easy to understand, but some of them are, are kind of complicated. And to me, this would be an example of that. And in the same way, Adrian, sometimes the rules that are in the Bible seem awfully hard to understand as well. And I see you nodding your head as I say that. Uh, so that's why in our lesson today, Jesus gives us a kind of a really nice short summary of all of God's commandments. He says, we should love the Lord our God, and we should love our neighbor. Love God, love our neighbor. And if you think about it, all the laws, all the rules, 
can be some can kind of be boiled down to just that. Love God, love our neighbor. And that's something that we can all do. And I think that's a great question to ask ourselves sometimes when we're we're not sure how well we're doing. So you ask ourselves, am I behaving in a loving way today? And it may be things aren't going right at home, maybe you're fussing with family, or maybe maybe you're back at school and things aren't going there with your friends. We can always stop and, and ask ourselves, am I behaving in a loving way today? Because if we do that, everything else will follow. So, thought for you and for all of our young people today. Our first scripture lesson is from the Psalms, and we invite Miriam McDonald to come and read for us. Good morning. The scripture lesson begins today at Psalms 90, verses 1 through 6. It's a prayer of Moses, the man of God. Lord, through all generations, you have been our home. Before the mountains were created, before you were made in the earth and the world, before you made the earth and the world, you are God without beginning or end. You turn people back to dust, saying, return to dust. For you, a thousand years are as yesterday. They are like a few hours. You sweep people away like dreams. They disappear. Or the grass that springs up in the morning in the morning it blooms and it flourishes, but by evening it dries and withers. O oh Lord, come back to us. How long will you delay? Take pity on your servants. Satisfy us in the morning with your unfailing love so we may sing for joy to the end of our lives. Give us gladness and prop proportion to our former misery. Replace the evil years with good. Let us see your miracles begin. Let our children see your glory at work. May the Lord our God show us his approval and make our efforts successful. Yes, make our efforts successful. This is the word of God for all the people. And our second lesson today is from the New Testament, from the Gospel of Matthew, in verse twenty-two, uh, chapter twenty-two beginning in verse 34. Hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together. And one of them, an expert of the law, tested Jesus with this question. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment of the law? Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All of the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. And while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them, what do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? The son of David, they said. Jesus said to them, how is it then that David, speaking by the spirit, called him Lord? For he says, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until my enemies under my feet. 
If then David called him Lord, how can he be his son? No one could say a word in reply. And from that day on, no one dared to ask Jesus any more questions. The word of God, my friends, for us, the people of God. Thank you, to God. We come to our time of prayer, and I invite you to share with one another and with God the joys and the concerns that you might have today. And I will start with the joy. This afternoon at 4 o'clock, I'm going to be officiating the wedding of a couple that some of you met when they came and worshipped with us back in September of last year. Um, Selimar Rains is the young lady's name. She's getting married to Patrick Lindsay. Um, Patrick is a United Methodist from Wayne, Maine. Uh, Selimar is, uh, a Roman, grew up in the Roman Catholic Church in Puerto Rico, which is her home. Uh, they came in September to check out the minister and called me a couple of weeks later and asked if I would officiate at their wedding, which I'm delighted to do. So I offer a prayer of celebration for this couple as they get married today. What other joys, what other celebrations, what other sorrows do we need to share? When you continue prayers for so continue prayers for Barbara and also um, prayers we hope they hope they find a cure for this, this, this disease this year. And prayers for um our prayers from for um Linda Linda Killer. Right? Yeah. And in in any way. Right? Yeah. Praise you, God, some water. Thank you, Chris. Well, I'd like praise for my um, daughter and my son in law, um, Bob and Wendy Warren, and the loss of their mother. Um, Bob's dad just died four months ago, and mom died from COVID on uh, Friday. So mm. continue prayers for them. I'm going to for me. I'm going to lost us lately, and for Matthew, who is in desperate need of some serious help. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I have a joy. Um, my husband and I, we traveled to Phoenix, Arizona on Thursday to visit our son. Who doesn't know her coming? We're surprised mm -hmm. with him, and we haven't seen him in years. So that's a joy. Mm -hmm. How do you know he's home? He's still here. Anybody else? Okay. Well, that's it. Again, I always pray for my granddaughter. My friends, let us go to God in prayer this morning, first with our silent prayers and then together as a community of faith. Let us pray. Dear God, this morning I wish I was as confident as the Apostle Paul in my faith, but I'm not. I know that I'm saved through your amazing grace. I know that Jesus loves me, for the Bible tells me so. I know that through the Holy Spirit, I am in a growing and deepening relationship with you. But I just don't have the confidence of Paul I so wish I did, but I don't. I'm not free of error, 
mixed motives or hidden agendas. I wish I were, but I'm not. I worry that I'm not strong enough in my faith, that I haven't learned enough in my education, that my life experiences are still too limited. What would you have me do in my doubt, O oh God, in my humanity, in my meanness? Help me to no longer see these things as wounds, but as sources of transforming divine strength for my life and for all whom I encounter. I know that you are in the mistake, the mess, and the makeover. May our words and actions reflect your love and your love alone. I know that you love me. I know that you love the world and all the people in it. Of this, I am confident, and that is enough. And with the power that comes to us from the words, may we offer to God the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. According to a young lady named Stephanie Hagyard, there's no doubt about it. Stephanie works long hours at an insurance brokerage firm in downtown Boston. But every Monday evening, she leaves work and she takes time from her full schedule to serve dinner at a drop-in center for people with AIDS near the government center district of Boston. She works hard each Monday night in the kitchen, but she says that she leaves this volunteer opportunity feeling more than refreshed. I feel better when I'm doing something good, Stephanie says. And researchers agree with her. They are calling this satisfying side effect of doing good for other people a helper's high a feeling of euphoria that one gets when we reach out in love to others. And maybe you've experienced this kind of high yourself after an act of sacrificial service. There's not been a lot of scientific research done about the biology of good deeds, but there are some scientists who are working in this area, and they do believe that positive social contacts release hormones called um, endorphins that indeed have the capacity to make us feel good about what it is that we do. Love your neighbor, says Jesus to the Pharisees in our text today. And he might have, had, might have added, if you do, it will give you a helper's high. Only in recent years has scientific investigation begun to explore the values to us of love and selfishness, or selflessness, excuse me. Why some people become remarkably kind and generous to family members and strangers alike. The value of this kind of research is that it gives us some guidance on how we might obey the great commandment as described by Jesus in today's lesson from Matthew. The text says, Love the Lord your God, love your neighbor as yourself. This week's lesson takes up immediately after the lesson that we looked at last week. Again, Jesus and his followers are in Jerusalem after the triumphant Palm Sunday entrance into David's city. And every day of that week, Jesus would sit in the courtyard at the great temple of Solomon, teaching to anyone who would come and listen. And each day, antagonists would have been sent by the, her the um, hierarchy of the temple 
with instructions to try and trick Jesus into condemning himself with something that he says. Last Sunday, we saw a group of Sadducees who were staunch supporters of the high priest and the temple authorities unsuccessfully try and lay a trap, a word trap, to trick Jesus into condemning himself. In today's lesson, the Sadducees have gone away defeated, and a group of legal experts called Pharisees have come to take their place and take their shot at entrapping Jesus. And the question they pose seems innocent enough. Teacher, what is the greatest commandment in the law? Now, what they're hoping here is that Jesus will name one specific commandment. Doesn't matter which one. Because when he does that, he will be condemning himself indirectly by asserting that all the other commandments were of lesser importance to God. Well, Jesus pretty quickly sees through all this, and he responds by quoting, not from the Ten Commandments, but from the central affirmation of Israel's faith in God called the Shema, which is found in chapter 6 of Deuteronomy. So what does it mean to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind? Traditionally in scripture, we love God by obeying God. We follow the inclinations of our God-attuned will as a way of honoring God in our life. And one is called to love God with one's whole self, one's entire being. But then Jesus adds a second part to this equation when he answers the Pharisees, essentially declaring that love for neighbor is almost as important as love for God. In other words, offering one's best to God is not sufficient to fulfill the heart of God's commandments. One must also offer one's best to others, to all those who are around us. And how do we love our neighbor? Just as love for God is not understood primarily as affection for God, in the same way, love for neighbors is expressed more by caring, thoughtful actions rather than whatever warm inner sentiments you might or might not have for your neighbor. So as much as we want to faithfully follow this commandment of Jesus, we sometimes feel like we need a roadmap that shows us where this love of God and love of neighbor will take us. For most of us, the great commandment is clear in its sense of moral obligation. Yet anything but clear when it comes to in, uh, putting it into practice on a day-to-day -day basis. Loving God, loving our neighbor, it's not really a matter of sentimentality. What we're talking about here is a love that manifests itself in commitment and in action. Love gets expressed not in thinking or feeling. This love gets expressed through doing. So what does that really look like? There's a family in Wisconsin by the name of Anglin. Mother, father, 15 children. Seven children are biologically theirs. Eight children have been adopted. All of the adopted children have special needs, ranging from cognitive defects to the absence of limbs. Patty Anglin, the mother, describes her family as being sort of a mini United Nations with children from a myriad of ethnic and racial backgrounds. Mr. and Mrs. Anglin grew up in the mission field of Africa. Both of their parents were missionaries they met in Africa, but today they live on a farm in Wisconsin called Acres of Hope. And their mission, as they see it, is to spread God's love one child at a time within their own local community. 
The Anglers show us that the power of love is seen most clearly when ordinary people like you and me do small things for others. Caring for a child, visiting the sick, helping a neighbor, or offering to step in for a caregiver. Another example of loving one's neighbor is Christina Noble, a poor and abused Irish girl from the slums of Dublin. Christina grew up with a dream. And as a middle-aged woman with no formal education, no money, and no real idea at all about what she was doing, she moved to Ho Chi Minh City in Vietnam where she discovered that God was calling her to work with children that lived in poverty. Children who were suffering just as she had suffered growing up in the slums of Dublin. In Ho Chi Minh City, on the first day that she was there, Christina saw two young girls dressed in rags playing in the dirt across the street from where she was staying. Well, that is, she thought they were playing in the dirt, but she soon discovered that what they were actually doing was grubbing for ants in the dirt and then eating them. That was their meal. One of these little girls reached out to Christina, aching for the touch of another human being. When Christina embraced her, she realized that she had made or was making a life-changing connection. This poor and crippled country would be the place of my salvation, Christina wrote, the place where I would regain hope and rebuild my life. Over the course of several years, Christina gained the confidence she needed to create a center for the care of street children. Today, at any given time, 75 children <coughs> reside in this center and receive day-to-day -day care while another thousand children are treated each month on an outpatient basis in a hospital as part of this center. Love of God, love of neighbor, the two came together when Christina discovered that God was challenging her to be and to do as God would have her do. I know these stories are so inspiring, and yet they always seem so overwhelming. They always seem removed from the world that we live in. And yet I want to say to you that I think that this church, we, this congregation, did exactly the same thing one Sunday morning last September when Amber went and answered the phone that rang during our worship service. It was a pastor from a little town outside of Charlotte, North Carolina. And this person was calling to see if we as a Methodist church would reach out to a lady named Betty Dolliver, who had recently come to this part of New Hampshire. I did reach out to Betty. We discovered that she had a daughter that lived in Hollis, New Hampshire, Betty had come up in September to visit her daughter and had become ill. She was diagnosed actually with lung cancer, ended up being treated through radiation and chemotherapy, and was told eventually that she could not risk the trip back home to North Carolina. For whatever reason, her daughter, who lived in Hollis, chose to place her mother in a um, assisted living facility here in Salem. And so we began to minister to Betty. We didn't think of it that way. What we did is we welcomed Betty when she came to church on Sunday mornings. Sometimes the assisted living facility would drive her over. Sometimes I would go get her. Sometimes one of you would go get her. We also would take turns or the assisted living facility would take her back home again. And Betty would sit in the back there where Noreen is sitting right now or just about there. And she would delight in being part of a faith community. And we would chat with her. We would help her get a cup of coffee after worship was over. 
We loved her. And we didn't think anything of it at the time because that's what we people do. But I want you to understand that that was loving our neighbor. That's exactly what God was talking about in this passage today. We didn't do it for the endorphins that may have rushed within our system. We wouldn't do it for the helper's high that scientists talk about. We do it because Jesus told us we should. Love our neighbor. Love God. The two are beautifully and eternally connected. This is the essence of the message to the assembled onlookers at the temple that day. Are you confused about how to love God? Then love your neighbor. The law of love is a powerful force in the university. And it doesn't really matter whether the love being expressed is in a large family in Wisconsin or among the street children of Ho Chi Minh City in Vietnam or right here in the pews of North Salem United Methodist Church. In every time, in every place, in every situation, Loving God by loving our neighbors will impact the world that we live in. It was the winter of of 1802. An elderly man was standing on the Virginia side of the Potomac River near a popular fording place, a popular place where the river was shallow enough to be able to cross over on horseback. But the man was walking. He didn't have a horse. And so he sat there in the cold, patiently waiting to cross the river. He was hoping to catch a ride, to be able to buddy up with someone else crossing over that day. Well, after a long wait, he spotted a group of riders coming towards him. He let the first one go by, the second one, the third one, the fourth one, the fifth one, and only when the sixth rider, the last rider, came, did the man stand up in front of the man on horseback, look him right in the eye and say, sir, would you give me a ride across the river? Well, the rider applied immediately, certainly, of course I will. The man climbed up on the horse, Across the river they went, and once they were safely across, the old man slid to the ground, grateful for dry passage across the river. The rider looked down and said, Sir, before you leave, I could not help but notice that you permitted all those other men to pass by without asking one of them for a ride. Yet when I drew abreast of you, you immediately asked me to carry you across the river. I'm curious why you didn't ask one of them, yet you asked me. The old man quickly responded. I looked into their eyes as they approached me, and I could see no love, and I knew in my own heart it was going to be useless to ask one of them for a ride. But when I looked in your eyes, I saw compassion, love, and a willingness to help others. I knew that you and only you would be glad to give me a ride across the Potomac. Well, the rider was deeply touched. Thank the old man for his kind words. I'm grateful for what you are saying, he said. I appreciate it very much. And with that, President Thomas Jefferson continued on his way back to the White House. My friends, I leave you with this question. If you had been the last rider that day, would the old man have asked you for a ride? Amen. There are many ways that we reach out and love our neighbor. We talked earlier about the canned goods that we've collected for the United Methodist Economic Ministry in Maine, and of the dollar, the monetary gifts that we sent to them this past week. I am so grateful for your generosity as a faith community that allows us to continue 
when opportunity presents themselves, continue to be able to reach out and help others. Love God, love our neighbors. That's what we're called to do. There's information in the bulletin about how we can continue to make gifts to the church electronically. Some of you um, have placed offering gifts in the collection plate at the door. I thank you so much for those gifts. Together, we will continue to be a faith community here at North Salem, no matter what COVID-19 does. Together, we will continue to be a community of faith that cares for one another, but also cares for others. And I thank you profoundly for the generosity that leads you to do that. Why don't you join me as together we share with each other the doxology that's in your bulletin. Praise God, from whom all blessings flow. Praise him, all creatures here below. Praise him above, ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Lord, of all that we see and all that we cannot see, give us this day a glimpse of the complexities of the world and the simplicity of living our lives centered in you. Loving you with all of our heart, soul, and mind. Loving our neighbors as well. Bless the gifts that we offer to you, O God, this day and that we have offered through the weeks. But in our giving, help us to focus on those other more basic gifts. May the love that we show you and others be a testimony of whom we follow and who is worthy of our devotion. For it is in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Uh, for a choir director from a Baptist church in Knoxville, Tennessee. It was written in 2015 by Mary McDonald. Um, the words are, Be still and know that I'm God. Be still and know that I am with you. Be still and know that I will comfort you in your hour of need. Um, be still and know that I am here for you. I will wipe away your tears and you will be renewed. Um, I am present in your pain, pain. I will always remain your comforter and friend. Be still and know that I'm God, that I will always be with you. Um, be still and know that I'm here for you. And as I, I will leave you my peace. I will leave you my peace. Peace, peace, peace. <laughs>
My friends, as you go forth this day, remember, it's just like the man standing on the riverbank. People are going to look us in the eye. And what will they see? My prayer is that they will see love of God, love of neighbor. That's who we're called to be, my friends. You go forth in peace this day. Amen.